Welcome, everybody, back to another episode of the Rising Tide Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Mo, and today we are diving into another topic, adapting to dynamic game situations. And joining us once again is the exceptional Coach Candace Motes, who strategically took her team to victory in the 2023 NAIA Women's Volleyball National Championship. Coach? It's so wonderful to have you back on the show. It's great to be here, Mo. I'm I'm excited about our topic today. Awesome. Well, uh, we do this quite a bit now, and I love it. So let's get right to it. Uh, Coach, today we are talking about adapting to dynamic game situations. And for my listeners, I am calling this conversations with a champion because that's exactly what Coach Mo says. And so, Coach, uh, from the perspective of someone who's just won a national championship, how did your team adapt to the unexpected challenges and capitalize on opportunities throughout the season on the way to winning the national championship? Well, I like we talked about, Mo, I think a lot of people think that uh, to win or even in our case, go undefeated, a lot of people think, oh, everything went perfect and everybody was healthy and everybody was in a good mindset and we had all this positivity going around our team, but that's not reality at all. We also had to struggle with the injury situations that came our way, um, kids getting sick. There were many, many different challenges throughout. And, you know, the scariest thing to hear as a coach is on game day, getting a text from either your athletic trainer or visit from your athletic trainer and saying, hey, I don't think that this person can go. And so you're sitting there and you're going, what? Um, I think that what's most important is that, you know, you have to prepare your team in a, in and expect these kind of things to happen. I don't think that you can just like, oh, let's just hope that we don't have any injuries throughout the season. Let's hope that nobody gets sick. Let's hope that nobody breaks up with their boyfriend. And that's just not reality. So you got to have always a backup plan for whenever these things are going to happen, not if they happen. You know, it makes it harder, too, when you have uh, pretty big impact players, maybe two or three on your team that are now facing the situation. And a lot of fear can come into that and you can make yourself feel like, oh, we're going to lose because we don't have this person or this person. And so um, some of the things that we did, you know, like I mentioned earlier on some of the other podcasts that we did is that we trained everybody in everything. So even if you're a back row player, there were, there were potential people that could hit. And so, you know, if somebody in the front row was getting in those situations where maybe they were injured or they needed to be less impacting. Um, we prepared people as kind of backups to go into the games. And that requires giving them opportunities throughout too, because you can't just wait to the last minute and then go, oh, by the way, you're going in. You know, we had a right side that was a starter on our team and she started getting uh, stress reactions, which were creating potential stress fractures and that the encouragement from our athletic trainer and from her family after many, many conversations was that, you know, she needed to sit out a little bit more in practices, which can be scary, you know, because you're thinking, well, your reps aren't going to be enough. And all oh, there were times where she had to miss games. So when you do that, you got to think about, all right, who, what do you need from a sub in that position? So if you're putting somebody in to replace a starter, what did that starter do for you? Or what do you need your sub to do for you to accommodate and adapt to what might possibly happen? So if that right side was a score person for us, then we need to put somebody in that's going to potentially have the ability to swing and score points. If that person was a good blocker for us, we need to have a good blocker. So it really doesn't depend on necessarily one person 
in a sub or the other. It just depends on what you need. And then also you can adjust your team dynamics. You know, I talked about how we put rotations in order. Maybe our right side wasn't going to be a score person and we just were going to make a good blocker out of that person. So we were going to know that, okay, our opponent was probably going to know that that person is not going to score for us. So we need to have other options to score. So we might rotate some other people in the back row that can hit. So we have a back row attack over our blocker on the right side. And this is pretty complicated. No, I don't want to go into too many details with how all these things work, but you can create hitting options without people being in the front row. And so you just have to rotate your people around knowing the strengths of the of the of what's needed and then protecting what we lost and not making it a significant loss. When you have particular situations that maybe are in a in the game where you're just feeling like, oh man, this is a major loss. Um, you might just have to consider the fact that you have to take a hit. And maybe you're not going to get a lot of scoring out of a particular uh, rotation that you would normally have that person scoring in and then make some adjustments. But really, it's just trying to figure out how to win the game. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have one person win the game for you. And I think that's the important piece, too, when you're putting a team together is that you got to have scoring options everywhere. You got to have defensive options everywhere. And you got to train all of those areas so that people are ready to go. We had a situation at the national tournament. Our best outside, big stud outside, uh, got sick. And it was in the semifinal match. Uh, she was throwing up all night. And everybody, of course, you know, is thinking, okay, this person is significant for our team. Significant. And and when you're faced with higher level teams that you're going to be playing, like in a semifinal of the national tournament or a championship in the national tournament, you're kind of considering what are you going to do in that situation? Me personally, with a lot of uh, fear, I went to her and said, you know what? We're going to be fine. We're not going to need you. It's okay. We want you just to know that you're not letting us down, that we're just going to give you whatever you need to be able to stay healthy. Hopefully we'll have you in the championship match. She came back to me and she said, coach, I don't want to come out. Um, I don't know how much I can give, but I said, well, okay, here's the situation. I'm going to, I'm going to put you in, but I'm not going to hurt our team because you're not feeling well, or you can't produce to the level that you need to. So you have to decide, am I going to be okay with the effort that I can give? And am I going to be enough? Because if you're worried about not scoring or not per performing like you normally do, and you start to drag the team down, then we're going to have to take you out. And it's not going to help our team. But if you can go in and know that I'm subpar, I'm not going to be at the level that I normally am, then okay. Will you be honest with me? And I'll be honest with you. So we agreed to that. Well, part of the part of halfway through the semifinals, one of the girls on the bench told me Ava just yelled out that she's gonna throw up on the court. And so I called oh, a no. timeout, which was a really, a really weird timing of a timeout. In fact, the announcers on ESPN were like, that's so weird. Why is she calling a timeout now? That's just like, well, basically we called a timeout and circled really tight in our huddle and Ava threw up. No, and you're kidding I, me. Really? It, into it, what? Into it, a bucket? Or? We, we, yeah, we, we had it prepared because she had been throwing up quite a bit. And our athlete trainer was there as well. And he was, he, he had given her a liquid IV, you know, before we started the game. And so was just giving her more drinks to kind of replace her electrolytes. And we we were just doing everything we could. And I said, Ava, I said, right now, um, I think that's best that you sit out for a second. And she agreed that she needed a timeout. So the other kid was ready, prepared to go in. 
everybody was like, what just happened? You know, we took Ava out. Well, then the rumor had it that she had been sick and throwing up. And then it started becoming a topic for the ESPN as well. Like, oh, what are they going to do? Whatever. But we just took breaks, Mo, and put her back in. And she just fought through it. So there's, I, I think the most important thing that I want to say is you can't panic when maybe those situations are happening in really key times. I think that sometimes a kid just needs to know that you still trust them and that you, they're enough, even though they don't feel like they are. Well, that's great. And uh, again, that's uh, yet another story that I had not heard. And that, that's, uh, that's funny. <laughs> well, you, you talk about you know, not not panicking, being adaptable. And so because adaptability is so essential in, in any sport, right, Coach? As those games took those unexpected turns, how do you, with your team, emphasize that importance of staying flexible and being prepared to adjust on the fly? Is that something that you talk about during practice times or during team meetings? Like, how do you get the team ready to know? Because the last thing, right, that you want is for somebody to go in, to be called off the bench and be like, oh, my gosh, now I'm going in. But it sounds like you had a handle on exactly what you were going to do, but you didn't necessarily know that that would happen. So how do you get them ready for that, knowing that it may or may not ever happen? Well, you know, like I said, you you first of all, you just have to train everybody and everything. So everybody is going to be ready for any situation that happens, for example, you know, there, there are people that play different positions. Uh, just sometimes we do a drill that just puts them in different positions than they normally play. Now, I don't anticipate that I at a national tournament would put somebody that's never set in a setting position, but um, there, are, there are opportunities that prepare them for all of the scenarios by just training them in every skill set. It, it's so important. And I think that in in club or high school, I think we, we say, oh, you're a middle. So you're going to be a middle only. So you're going to just work on blocking. You're just going to work on hitting. And that's all you're going to do. Well, if somebody's sick in the back row or somebody gets hurt in the back row, you might have to pull your middle off to pass. So we our middles pass they work on passing so they're not freaked out if we have to bring them back into the lineup so that we can cover for somebody that might be injured or we might make our middles play we always make our middles play defense so that if they go back to serve everybody serves on our team like nobody sits back and doesn't serve everybody works on serving so they go back to serve and then they go to a position that is going to be a defensive position because maybe they're the next best person that's going to fit into that role. Everybody is comfortable with doing that. They're not feeling like, well, this is the first time I've ever played defense in the back row. They play defense and work on defense every single day in every practice. So there's no positions. Maybe I would just say setting, Mo, is maybe the only thing that I'm not going to really put somebody in that's going to not work on it. But we do have them do drills that include setting, you know, because sometimes in the middle, I mean, there's been situations where a setter has, you know, been in a situation where we've had to sub someone else in and maybe they're short. So we have to run two different setters from the back row, which we don't normally do. And we might have a middle rotate all the way through and they might get to the right side and they might just become the setter in the front row. The balls come because they may have hands that can set a ball. And we just say, set the ball up, make it hittable and we're ready to go, you know, and dump the ball if nobody's on you. And so you get a 6-1 middle up there in the front row that people are like, what, who's setting, you know, and here she is in the front row, taking the ball and dumping the ball. And nobody's even on her because they think, well, there's no, there's only two hitters. So they're all going to go over and, you know, so creatively coming up with situations that are going to help opponents 
Like, it's not just, you have to think creatively. And that's something that Ruth Nelson taught me is Ruth Nelson is a Olympian coach that has been in my life and has the most creative coach that I've ever known. And will often tell me, don't think out of, or think out of the box. Don't think just, this is the only way you can do it. And it has helped me so much. Like, there are other ways that you can run something without traditionally having a setter in three hitters or a setter in two hitters. You can do a lot of different things and that creates such a fun environment because everybody is involved in places where they aren't necessarily stuck always training. You know, they feel like they have options and it's fun for them. So that those are ways that I think you can adapt by just thinking out of the box and not being so traditional. Yeah, coach, let's talk specifically about your opponents. How do you capitalize on your opponent's weaknesses? As a coach, when you go in, you have specific game plans. I see you because, you know, you and I share a wall uh, in our office and you're always going over game film. Your assistants, they're always going over game film. You're always writing something down. The yellow pads, note pads that you use, they're, they're just all filled up with all of this stuff. What, what do you do? You've only got so much time for our coaches out there that, that are, are watching the thinking, how do I spend my time properly? How do I invest it in the right things? How do you prepare for an opponent? Obviously, um, going 28-0 uh, this year and winning the national championship, you prepared well enough to beat all of your opponents. How do you get ready for that? Is it is it the same for every opponent? Is it is there certain things you do for every opponent? Is there uh, different things? Knowing that you're going to get into these dynamic situations that are going to cause you to have to adjust. What do you do? Yeah. So first of all, Ma, we were uh, 38 and 0 instead of 28 and 0. I'm kidding you. Oh, um, I love. Sorry about that. I can do that to you. No. It's fun. Well, well in, in um, my defense, you I you think... were twenty eight and zero, um, and then on the way to thirty eight no. So there you go. Yeah, correct. There you go. I think Mo that you're never going to do the same thing against an opponent. I'm a visual learner. Uh, that's why you're going to see me watch film all the time because I will. I learn more visually than I do statistically. Although statistically things are going to help me as well. Uh, who's got the highest hitting percentages in each rotation? Who's who like, here's a big stat that is so noticeable. If you have a particular team that has maybe two hitters on the team that are scoring, you're going to see hitting attempts. I look at that all the time. I'm going to look at a team's hitting attempts. If a player has seven who hitting attempts and the next closest person has got 300 and some hitting attempts well then we are going to commit block on that kid that's got 700 plus in the front row because we know they're a go-to so if you shut down that person we're figuring let's just take it at us you know come at us with your other two because we know that your best person is shut down so that's something that I'll look at. But in the big picture, watching film for me is just keeping track of where is a team going if they're out of system and where is a team going if they're in system? How many times does a team go in a particular rotation? So every rotation is going to be watched. What percentage of sets go to this particular player what percentage of sets go to this player and so forth depending on if you're in system or you're out of system so like i said before on podcasts we work on out of system all the time how good are they on out of system you know so we're going to work on that where's their defensive positioning so are they a rotational defense where they're covering the corners on the side of the hitter or are they a perimeter defense so they've got gaps in the corners and where we practice hitting the corners all the time. That's what we do. We are every drill we do, we're working on hitting the corners because that's the hardest position to defend is a deep corner shot on either corner. So we're working on that all the time. I think that film for, for all of us 
depending on what you find to help you and the strategy to put together for your team to feel confident to go in and know that team. I think we prepare our players extremely well. Like they have no surprises. It usually is exactly how we say it because we don't just watch one, the last match that they, somebody played. I'm watching maybe three matches of the last three they played. I assistant is watching maybe two more past that, that. So we're, we're comparing, this is what they're consistently doing. And that helps a lot um, in preparing them for a very true scenario of what they probably can expect from each of them. But I will say, even though we do that, there are times that it is completely opposite. And here's where we get back to the adaptability of we'll get there and we get our team so fired up and they are so prepared and they're so ready and they think they got the best game plan and they're going to go in there and win. And then we look on the other side of the court and, oh, wait, where's uh, so-and-so? Or where, what, what happened to that person? And now all of a sudden, wait, that's not where they're going with the ball now because that kid's sitting on the sideline <laughs> with a boot on. Or, you know, um, like maybe somebody's going off on their team. That happened to me this year. We were in a scenario where we were an opponent, conference opponent, and the, a girl that hardly, our opponent hardly ever scores, doesn't really have that big of a threat on the court, is just going off like crazy. And we can't stop her. She's scoring. She's hitting line. She's hitting cross. She's tipping. She's, she's just scoring, and they're feeding her, you know, because, like, any smart coach knows that, like we call this Mo, we call it feed the bear. If you got somebody on the on your side <laughs> that's just scoring and you can't stop them, feed the bear. You Absolutely. know, the bear is scoring. And that opponent was feeding their bear like big time and we couldn't stop her. And so it threw us off a little bit, you know, because now the big stud that we thought was going to get all the sets or was going to get most of the attempts was not really there, but she was available. So then you had to kind of like, Oh, okay. How do we, how do we adjust, you know? And so what we did was we decided that we needed to stop the bear. So we started committing a little bit more towards her to just shut her down and get her slowing down. And then we set our defense up around the big hitter to hopefully be able to dig her. And that, that's stuff that happens all the time. You just have to adapt and you got to trust your kids that, hey, this is something that we didn't prepare for, but we're still okay. And I think the most important thing is not to panic. You just have to trust and you have to believe in your players and you have to believe in your program and, and believe that just because it looks different doesn't mean that we're not capable of pulling the win out. So we did a lot of scenarios like that. Um, we were in a situation, Mo, sometimes as much strategy as you can give to a team, sometimes the answer is just pure grit and pure belief and pure desire to not lose. And we were in a national tournament. We were in pool play and we were playing an opponent that was like 30 miles from us. So we went 12 hours, both of us, to Sioux City, Iowa play. to play each other. And we were 30 minutes away from each other. Um, had played each other already. We had come out on top and here we are playing them again. Well, of course, they had nothing to lose. We didn't have that. It's it's pool play, you know, we're, we're a little bit like we got to get out of pool play. You know, that was our goal, really, because we had never really been affected. We had done it one time since we had been at Nationals, but we had never really gotten out of it before. So the energy was a little more uh, stressful on our end. Like we were a higher seed. We had to win. We've won before. 
And you know, when you're playing somebody for a third time, it can be a battle. Well, we found ourselves down two. Oh, no, I'm sorry, two to one. We found ourselves down two to one. And they had the momentum in game in set three. And we were like faced with the fact that we were going to lose this and we were going to be eliminated. I called a timeout and the faces are just like, oh my gosh, we cannot lose to this team. And I looked at them and I said, we are not going to lose to this team. We are not going to give up. We are not going to believe that they have the momentum. We are going to go back out there. We are going to believe in our team. We are going to find the grit that we've never had before in our whole lives. We are going to find the emotion. And I said, all I'm going to do is I'm going to cheer my guts out on the sideline. So because I believe in you, I believe in this team, and we are going to go out there and we are going to finish this game, this match, and we're going to win it. And I'm like, Mo, oh, I could, I could say that all I want to, but something has to be in leadership on the court to make that happen. I saw the girls get into a huddle after they went out, and honestly, in my heart, I was like, well, this is do or die, because if they win this last set, we're done. And they went out and I saw something in them. That's that out team our opponent piece that I saw finally come to life. And they looked at each other and they had a focus like I never seen. And they wanted it. And I think that there comes a time, no matter what you do in adaptability, strategy, anything that you can do as a coach, you may not be enough. And it may just have to be that your team wants it more than you want it. And I think that that's something that has to be developed in that you've got to say to them throughout the season, this is your program. This is where this is driven by you. This is where we're going together, but you're a team and we can only do so much. And you've got to step in and lead this program to where you want it to go. And I saw that come out and I don't know, Mo, if I have words to, to try to, you know, tell a coach here on this podcast at what, what they could do. I just, I just know, Mo, I laid it all out and just hoped for the best. <laughs> That's literally what I did. I hoped for the best. Well, uh, I, I think you experienced the best, which was uh, great. So it, I think what you did was uh, was probably the right moves. Coach, it's, it really is impressive how your team was able to thrive under pressure for an entire season. And I know that pressure mounted more and more after each win because people were just thinking, wow. They're still going. They're still going. Uh, the challenging situations that you had, all of the things that you overcame in your girls, um, it was just phenomenal. It was fun to watch. And so, Coach, before we conclude today, do you have any final thoughts or advice for our listeners out there on how to cultivate adaptability in their own lives, in their own teams, whether it's on the court or off the court or in a boardroom or uh, in, in the cubicles that are around them? Uh, or the leadership roles that they have. What what advice do you have for, for our listeners today? Well, I, I think that, you know, in being able to determine what you can do to adapt, uh, I think you have to know the people that you're trying to adapt with. You know, if you don't, if you don't know what others need at certain times, like, and this isn't one thing that somebody needs. My setter might need to just be told, you're doing a great job. You are setting a good your offense, your your hitters just maybe aren't hitting the places they need to, but you're doing a good job and just keep going and keep encouraging your hitters, keep encouraging your passers. Some might in the back row might need, you know, as a defender, you might need, you know, you need to get to that line. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't get to that line, you're hurting our team. And we're going to have to replace you if you don't get to that if you don't take that job seriously and get there because they might just need a, a little kick, you know, to just say, come on, step up. Everybody's different and everybody has something that they need to be able to get themselves to a contribution. But I think the biggest thing is that they got to do it for each other. So you got to build 
a team. And I'm not just say, saying skill sets. You got to build a group of people that have a vision and have a dream because you can dream all you want as a coach, you can, as a business person, whatever you're doing, you can dream all you want for what you're trying to impact. But if the people you're working with don't have the same dream or they're not dreaming it for themselves and each other, your dreams are just going to be dying. Because you can't make people do something if they don't want to. So how do you inspire and communicate and lead and mentor showing the people you're with? These are the things I believe that we're possibly able to achieve. And now I'm dreaming this and this is where I'm heading. And I am hoping that all of you can find your place in that and keep dreaming with me. And I think if we do this together, we're going to get to a much bigger picture than what we ever thought we could. Wow. Again, uh, Coach, wise words, uh, as always. Uh, thanks again for sharing your insights with, you know, the other coaches out there who are listening today. And uh, why listeners hearing from leaders and how they do things is always uh, incredible. And so I can't thank you enough. And uh, to our listeners, thank you for uh, tuning in to the Rising Tide Leadership Podcast. Again, this has been Conversations with a Champion. Today, we talked about adapting to dynamic game situations. And so we hope that you will join us uh, for the next part of this series as we continue to explore leadership excellence. Until then, thanks again, Coach. Thanks, Mike.